صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا نبي الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المذلومين المعصومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك السلام على الحسين المذلوم المقتول المجروح الأطشان المذبوح من القفاء في يوم عاشوراء في أرض كربلاء بلا جرم ولا خطأ الذي غسله دموه وكفنه رمال كربلاء مقطع الأعضاء مسلوب العمامة ردائي عليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال قائل منهم لا تقتلوا يوسف وألقوه في غيابة الجب صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله على محمد وعلى محمد The Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam <clears throat> On one occasion in conversation with Jibra'il, the archangel asks Jibra'il if ever he's been in distress, if ever he's been tired, if ever he's had a sense of severe and intense worry. Jibra'il says so far in all of the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent me on this earth for, there have been three occasions where I've had a severe stress and I've been very tired. The first was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one occasion ordered me and told me that get to this earth as quickly as possible and ensure that Ibrahim alayhi salam's body does not touch the fire. Jibra'il says, I left from my station in the heavens and I came as quickly as I could onto this earth. In that place where Ibrahim alayhi salam was about to be placed in the fire and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told me that if I don't reach there before the fire touches him, then I myself will perish. I reached there just before Ibrahim alayhi salam is touched by the fire and I asked him, Ya Nabi Allah, Ya Khalil Allah, is there anything that I can do? And Ibrahim alayhi salam would reply, yes, uh, is there anything you need? And Ibrahim alayhi salam says, yes, but not from you. What I need is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this was the first occasion when I was very distressed and tired from reaching him very quickly. The second time when I was also very stressed and tired out was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered me once again to come onto this earth as quickly as possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told me that before that knife reaches the neck of Ismail, get there as quickly as you can and exchange Ismail for a ram or another animal. Likewise, I was told if I don't reach there, before the, neck touches, uh, before the knife touches his neck, I will also perish. And so as quickly as I could, I left my station in Jannah. And I got to Ibrahim and I swapped over Ismail for the ram. And the third of these cases in my life was when a group of brothers decided to throw their brother Yusuf down the well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered me and told me, reach there before Yusuf alayhi salam reaches the bottom and protect him from dying from this fall. And if you do not get there before he is injured, you shall perish. And so, Ya Rasulullah, I left as quickly as I could from my station in Jannah. 
And as soon as I reached there, I saw he is in between the well and the bottom. As Quran al Karim says, Ghayabat al Jub. And when I reached there, I protected him from reaching the bottom. And the snakes that were there at the bottom of the well that had tried to bite him and injure him, I had told them that this is a prophet of God. Do not touch him. These were the three cases where Jibreel said, I was made to rush on this earth and I became tired. The third of these is the center of our discussion today. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran in Surah Yusuf, قَالَ قَائِلٌ مِّنْهُمْ لَا تَقْتُلُوا Yusuf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell us who said this. Doesn't tell us the name of that person. Rather, riwayat of Ahlul Bayt alayhimu salatu was salam explained to us who was this qa'il, who was the one that said this. For he said to his brothers, do not kill Yusuf. Instead of killing him, throw him in the bottom of the well. This is the analysis that I wish to look at tonight. The analysis of this verse, where one brother tells his others, don't kill him. Rather, instead of killing him, let's throw him in the bottom of the well, so that passers-by will see. They will try to take water from this well, out will come this youth, and they will take him with him, and never will he be seen again. Who was this person? Why did he say what he said? And what were the themes that Mufassirin of Quran discussed when they discussed this verse? And what are the, some of the comparisons that we find between this event and another event in history? Now when the ulama, they came to analyze this verse, the Mufassirin, the first thing they said is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this part of the story of Yusuf, salamullahi alayhi, was giving us a very important message. And that was that these people had committed what type of sin? Not only have they lied to their father, they've lied to a prophet of God, Yaqub alayhi salam. They have gone against the amana that they were given with. They have mistreated someone that was younger than them. They have tried to kill an infallible and a prophet of God. Despite all of these things, imagine how many things come all together in these brothers of Yusuf. They go against the order of their father, they disrespect him, they lie to him, they go against his amana, they try to kill a prophet of God. Despite all of this, the Mufassireen say that one of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to speak about this event in history is that so no one would ever despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That despite everything that they committed and everything that they did, Despite throwing their brother into the well and leaving him to die of thirst or hunger or for someone to pick him up. Yet still afterwards when they return to Yusuf and they repent to him, Allah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives. And so the first thing that we were told about these verses of Surah Yusuf is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was highlighting that message of never despair in the mercy of Allah. For even these people, who were seen to be the worst of people, for they did this to their own brother, even these people gained rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Often a person, and I mentioned this in one of the nights, a person will commit one sin. And when he commits that sin, really he has regret. He becomes upset. Why did I do this? Why did I do something that takes me further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why would this enter into my mind? And so he repents. Then, once again, he performs the same sin and again, the same regret comes. When this happens a number of times, what starts to enter into your heart? Despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For often we compare Allah's mercy to the mercy of me and you. That someone who's forgiving in this world, a human being, will forgive once, will forgive twice, will forgive three times. Eventually they won't forgive. Or they'll forgive this type of person and that type of person and that type of person. But other groups of people, they won't forgive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlighted this story so that yes, min rawhillah, despair in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't enter into someone's heart. And in this regard, there was a riwayah mentioned by Mullah Faid al-Kashani in his tafsir al-Safi. Where Mullah Faid rahmatullah alayhi quotes Nabi Musa alayhi salam. As you know, Musa sallallahu alayhi has a cousin by the name of Qarun. And Qarun was someone that often would disrespect Musa alayhi salam in public. Qarun is someone that doesn't wish to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qarun is someone that indulges in sin. <coughs> Musa alayhi salam is patient. When these things take place, 
He has patience. One of the tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth for the human being and for the mu'min, is you have your close relatives that, for example, fight with you, that are irreligious, that disrespect you. This is one of the tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa alayhi salam has patience. Musa alayhi salam doesn't say anything. Until in the riwayah that Mullah Muhsin mentions and quotes, until in the riwayah that he quotes, he says that Musa on this occasion loses his patience. No longer can he be patient with Qarun. The reason behind that is مختلفون fi. There's difference of opinion as to why he says no more. One idea is that Qarun hires a woman of the town who was known for indecency and committing haram and for earning her livelihood from haram. He orders her to go into those gatherings where people would gather around Musa alayhi salam. Prophet of God, he goes somewhere, people gather around. People ask him questions. They ask him about the wahi and revelation that has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So on one occasion, she uh, is ordered by Qarun that when he's there with those people that respect him, that take him to be a prophet of God, you come and you start complaining and say that this person committed indecency with me. And so she says, I entered into this gathering. And every time I would say, oh people, I wish to say something. And whenever she would say, oh people, I wish to say something, they look towards her and she tries to make this false claim. Whenever she tries to make this false claim, her tongue is stuck. Her mouth is unable to speak. <clears throat> so people wonder what's going on and they continue looking at Musa alayhi salam. Second time again, she says, I wish to say something. Again, they look at her. Again, she tries frozen. When this happens a third time, Musa alayhi salam takes her on the side and says, what is the qadiyah? What's going on here? So she says, look, ya, ya Kaleem Allah. I've been employed by your cousin Qarun to do this. This angers Musa alayhi salam. Angers Musa that he comes in front of Qarun and he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, you're a prophet of God, you're an infallible. If you want him to be punished, I've given you that power and I know that you won't do anything that goes against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Musa Salamullah alayhi, he says to Qarun, what do you think that you can do whatever you want? Disrespect me, commit these sins and Allah won't punish you. So now Qarun becomes a bit frightened. Now Musa is serious. And so Musa alayhi salam addresses the earth and says, O oh earth, swallow him. And so the earth, we're told, as is mentioned in the Wayad, this was the adab of Qarun. Half of his body is under the earth, swallowed. Now he's so up, so scared, so frightened. He said, oh my cousin, ya Musa. He starts to try and ask him, please forgive me. When he tries to say, please forgive me, Musa says, la tazidni bi kalamik. Don't talk too much. I don't want to hear these excuses. Don't talk. And again, Musa alayhi salam addresses the earth with the permission of Allah, swallow him. Now the earth is up to his chest. Again, Qarun says, please have some mercy. I'm sorry. Musa says, La tazidni bi kalamik. Until all of his uh, body is, uh, is taken up by the earth, Musa alayhi salam, according to this riwayah, then goes in munajat, speaking with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he goes to con converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he begins to speak in the mountain, Allah isn't in a place, of course, but that place where Allah would send his revelation. When he tries to speak to Allah, do you know what Allah says? Allah says, Ya Musa, la tazidni bi kalamik. He says, Musa, don't speak too much. So Musa stops. He says, Ya Allah, are you upset with me due to what I've done? He says, No, you're a prophet of God, you're an infallible. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then why would you say, La tazidni bi kalamik? Don't speak too much. Musa says, The only reason I didn't listen to what he told me, his plead for forgiveness, is because he didn't say your name. He didn't say for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tawheed hadn't entered into his heart. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied to Musa and said, Ya Musa, if Qarun had said the same thing to me just once, I would have forgiven him. Don't have despair in the mercy of Allah. For even Qarun, a person like Qarun, Allah said, if sincerely he asks me just once, 
He asked for repentance and forgiveness, I would have forgiven him. The reason why this story of the brothers of Yusuf was mentioned was to highlight this. We commit sin, we perform error, but never have yes or despair in his mercy. Rather be of those that is able to call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sincerity and a pure heart. Mufassireen then when they came to analyze this verse, when one of them said, don't kill Yusuf, they understood that this person had good intentions. It's not that he wished to harm Yusuf alayhi salam, rather he wishes to protect him. That this is my brother, this is the favorite of my father, this is the best of all of us. Rather than them killing him, I wish to stand up for his rights and for his haqq. And so this brother, who some of the riwayat say his name was Lawi, who will speak about this who Lawi was later on. Lawi, the reason why he says such is to protect the life of his brother. And so the scholars say that this was one of the best examples in Quran al Kareem of this idea of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi an al Munkar. Why? Because this ayah was speaking about one very specific type of sin. Sins, as we know, are of different types. This sin, when it was committed, when it was being performed, it was necessary for this brother Lawi to stand up and say something. What sin was that? As I said, sins have different categories. Actions that I perform are of different categories. But this one was very special. What do I mean? There are two types of hukum that we are told about in jurisprudence. This is quite simple. It may sound technical. It's very simple. One is called al-hukm al-awwali. The other is called al-hukm al-thanawi. Al-hukm al-awwali in jurisprudence is when you look at something, the hukm and the ruling of sharia in regards to something, without considering any other factor or without considering any other circumstance. So for example, I asked the faqih and the jurist, what is the hukm of drinking water? Without looking at anything else, al-hukm al-awwali. The jurist came and said to me that drinking water is permissible, mubah. Permissible. This was hukm al-awwali. Then came hukm al-thanawi. What was hukm al-thanawi? When you look at the same thing in relation to something else. For example, I asked the faqih and the jurist, what is the ruling and the hukm of drinking water for someone that if he doesn't drink it, he'll die? Here the jurist said to me, what? For that person it becomes wajib. If he doesn't drink this, he's going to die. It becomes wajib for him to drink this. So everything in my life has one hukum, which is the primary ruling without looking at any other factors. The other is the secondary that takes a certain factor into account. And as we've seen, something may have one hukum in the first and another in the second. An even simpler example, fasting. What's the hukum of fasting? Uh, without looking at anything else, fasting on a person is wajib. For a person who is diabetic and whom, for whom fasting is dangerous and harmful, it becomes what? It becomes haram. Breaking your salah. Hukm al-awwali without looking at anything else is what? Haram. Breaking your salah because someone is drowning and you breaking your salah means that you will save that person's life. Now it became what? Wajib. So one we, once we understood that we have two types of hukum and two types of looking at these rulings, there are two things in this dunya, the hukm al-awwali and hukm al-thanawi is always the same. Or if I was to say that in simpler language, two things that never change, two things that always remain the same. The first is the fact that adil and adala and justice is wajib. The second is that zulm and injustice and oppression is haram. These two will never change. No matter what the circumstance is, adil is seen as good. Adil and adala and justice is seen as wajib and zulm and oppression is seen as haram. Why was it incumbent upon this brother Lawi to stand and say, La taqtulu Yusuf. وَأُلْقُوهُ فِي غَيَابَةِ الجب was because this was an example of zulm and injustice. This was an example of oppression. And so the scholars came and looked at this idea, this idea of Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi anil Munkar. For we understand that often people take certain things lightly. You know, there's certain things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put a lot of emphasis on. 
Quran al Karim put a lot of emphasis on that me and you we take light, lightly. One of these is Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahi an al Munkar. At least with your close family, at least with your close friends, those that you are very close with and you can have a conversation with, it was your wadifa, amaliya, shar'iya, your shar'i responsibility. And I'll tell you why. It was explained to us, i.e., the importance of this amal. Of when, for example, my brother is doing something he shouldn't do and he is unaware of it. Or he's aware of it, but he's doing it anyway, that I go and tell him. That are my very close friends. Yes, there are conditions. You can read those conditions in the books of fiqh and jurisprudence. But the reason why it was so important is because people have this idea. This is one of the discussions that is brought about when we speak about Islam and freedom. Which is people say that I have the freedom to perform any action as long as it is not affecting others. I can perform any sin at home, any act of disobedience at home, as long as it's not affecting others around me. Yes, if my actions are affecting my neighbor, my parents, my family, then we can say that I don't have complete freedom. But those actions that I perform in the secrecy of my home which don't affect anyone, I should be allowed to do this. What effect does it have on anyone else? People have this mentality. This was replied to by Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. For the love of Fatima to Zahra alayhi wa sallam, recite a second salawat. <coughs> Where the Prophet of Islam gives the example of a ship. People entered onto this ship. Some said we'll take the top deck. Others said we'll take the bottom. So some went onto the top deck, others said we'll take the bottom deck. Those at the bottom said we need water. But why should we disturb those that are above us? You know, to get water, we'd have to go up, we'd tell them to put out whatever, a bucket, get water, then bring it. It's disturbing them. So why not we'll just make a hole at the bottom of this ship so that we don't disturb them. It's not uh, interfering with them in any way. And we take water fr uh, from this route. Without going on the top, disturbing them, taking water and bringing it back down. He said, if this is the case, what's going to happen? Those people think that they're actually doing a favor to those on top. They think that their actions are not affecting those on top. However, every hole that they drill is directly affecting those on the upper deck. And eventually, if they are not stopped by others, then every single person will drown. Every single person will die. The Prophet of Islam says this is the example of the person when he thinks that he can perform whatever he wants as long as it's not affecting someone else. And this is the example of those people that don't do Amr bil Ma'roof and Nahi anil Munkar. Because they think that my action, this is what I'm doing, is not affecting anyone else. Of course it is. You don't realize that this sin that you commit affects others spiritually in ways that maybe you don't realize in ways that you can't see but the more a person becomes a sinner he affects the mujtama he affects the society and so in the way that those in the top uh, on the upper deck come in the bottom and say what do you think you're doing all of us are going to to drown it's the responsibility of those who are aware of ma'roof to tell those who are going towards munkar and this verse was highlighting this idea. Mufassirin also said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in many verses of Quran, of them this verse, told us, كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةً كَثِيرًا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Sometimes one voice is enough. We have how many brothers? 10, 11. One voice is enough to save that prophet of God. Eventually that prophet of God then becomes the head of uh, Egypt. Because of him so many people are saved from dying of hunger. If you read in the story of Yusuf this is clear السلام, That because then he survives, then he goes to prison, then he becomes in charge of the finances, then he becomes the head of Egypt. How many thousands of lives are saved? Why? How many lives are saved? Because of the voice of one person. Quran al Karim told us never be of those that think what is the difference if what, what difference will one voice make? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this one voice, even though he was outnumbered, made a big difference. That this one voice was the reason that an infallible is saved, and thousands of lives are also saved. 
Why often I give this example, Ibrahim al-Khalil, alayhi salam. Ibrahim on one occasion when he does the hajj, when he performs the hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the first time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, call out to the people. For until the day of Qiyamah, any person that performs hajj is resp responding to the call of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Call out, call people to hajj. So you know what the reply was of Ibrahim alayhi salam? Ibrahim said, I'll call. But how are they going to hear this call of mine? You're saying, Ya Allah, until the day of judgment, every single person will hear your call. And that when they perform hajj, this is in response to this da'wah to Ibrahim, the invitation of Ibrahim. How will they hear it? Allah says, no, it's your job to say those words. It's my job to make it heard in front of every single person's uh, ears. It's your job to say it. It's my job to make it heard. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes give, gives power just to one voice. When we have zulm and oppression, oppression, never think that one voice isn't enough. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives many examples where one voice has this effect. For the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, walks by a piece of land that was fertile. When he walks by this fertile piece of land, he sees nothing is growing on it. Now this is a waste of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ni'mah and bounty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a fertile piece of land. You own it, use it, grow, earn money, give food to others, be a part of society. So why are they not growing anything on this piece of land? So when the Prophet of Islam sees this fertile piece of land empty, he says, call the owners of this land. When the owners of this land came, Rasulullah said, why? Why is it empty? Nothing is growing. They said, Ya Rasulullah, yes, it's very good land. But we've got one problem. What's the problem? He says, the problem that we have is that uh, we don't have a water source. There's no well here. There's no stream here. There's no lake that is close by that can hydrate this land to ensure that crops will grow. There's no river. There's no stream. That's why we don't plant. So Rasulullah gave a solution. And this solution isn't just for the one who's farming. Ulama understood this in many different levels. One of them is the way I'm telling you today. Where the Prophet of Islam gives them a solution. Rasulullah says it's your job to sow the seed and plant it. It's Allah's job to give you water and hydrate this land. Likewise, it's your job. To stand up in the way that this one brother Lawi stands up against oppression. Allah's job for it to be made heard. Likewise, it's your job to seek knowledge. Allah's job to give you tawfiq. One person is able to save the life of thousands of individuals. In addition to this, we understand that this verse in Quran was teaching us a very interesting philosophy of life. That is something which should actually be very simple and very straightforward. But people often forget. And that was that this brother Lawi, he very strategically wishes to save the life of his brother Yusuf. And so he acts as if he's uh, on their side saying, look, let's just throw him in here. Even though actually he's supporting his brother. When he's thrown into that well, as I said, Jibrail comes and protects him. But Yusuf alayhi salam is hungry for a few hours he stays there. Hungry, thirsty, alone, with the darkness, with fear in his heart. Uh, with fear in his heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, however, saves his life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching us a philosophy. And that was, sometimes you have to sacrifice one thing in order to save something else. Something, sometimes you have to face one harm in order to save yourself from another harm. For he has to be in the darkness of the world, hungry, thirsty, all alone, in danger. He has to sacrifice these things so that he can sacrifice his life. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes makes me sacrifice one thing so that I can gain something else. Sometimes I have to face one harm so that I'm saved from a bigger harm.
And that's how we understand this philosophy of imtihan and the trials of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to show me the harm of marad and illness so that I'm saved from, for example, the harm, the bigger harm of arrogance. Sometimes I go through the other harms of imtihan and the tests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save me from a bigger harm. This incident, therefore, also explained to us Sayyidu Shuhada, salamullah alayhi. For how many people ask this question, those that aren't that accustomed with the whole story of Imam Hussein? How many people ask the question, what took place? Was he successful on that day? Did he win? Was he able to succeed on the 10th of Muharram? The answer comes in this story. For he was thrown Yusuf in the well. And even though he may have been injured, his life was saved. Because one thing was sacrificed to sacrifice to, in order to save something much bigger. Likewise, in the story of Sayyidu Shuhada, Salamullah Alayhi, one thing was sacrificed, the blood of this Imam, to, sacrifice, to save something much larger. And that was the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This philosophy of I give one thing, but something else is saved. Or I have one harm to save myself from something which is greater. Hussein salamullah alayhi gives his blood from his own heart so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to save this religion and so that people know that one thing which Islam never accepts is a dhalim and a person who is an oppressor. If all of these issues have been understood, we come to Lawi. As I said, Lawi is a brother and according to most, Lawi is the oldest of the brothers and he was of those who was the most respected by those people, by his brothers, his family. They used to come to him for advice. Even though riwayat don't tell us a lot about Lawi, we're told that he was given a gift by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This gift was given to him, why? Was given to him for saving the life of a prophet of God. Because you saved the life of your brother Yusuf, Allah gives you a gift, which is what? Which is, what the which is that the lineage of the prophets of God after Yusuf come in whose line? The prophets that come after Yusuf alayhi salam, they, they're not from the lineage of Yusuf salam alayhi. Rather as a gift for saving the life of a prophet of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places the anbiya in the progeny of Lawi. And this was one of the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him. And when I read this, I remembered something else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling us that one of his principles that he abides by is when someone saves the life of a prophet of God, the infallibles are part of his lineage. Now we understand why the A'imma were from the lineage of Abu Talib alayhi salam. For Abu Talib is the one who saves the life of the Prophet of Islam on many occasions. This was the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to him. Likewise, why were the Imma from the lineage of Sayyid al-Shuhada? We hear this often. One of the gifts that he was given for saving Islam and the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If all of these issues then have been understood, we find some comparison between the story of Yusuf and what takes place with Lawi and those on the 10th of Muharram. For when Nabi Yusuf السلام, is placed in the well, Yusuf السلام, begins to call out. He says to his brothers, after I'm dead, whenever you see a youth, remember me. Whenever you see someone thirsty, remember me. Whenever you hear of someone hungry, remember me. Whenever he, if you hear of someone alone, remember me. If someone asks you this remembrance of Sayyid al-Shuhada and the Madloom, is this something that was practiced? This was something that Yusuf alayhi salam himself said as part of his wasiyya. For Yusuf said, I wish to be remembered because I'm a Madloom. This is then why we remember the one who also would give the same type of wasiyya. Whenever you drink water, remember me. Whenever you see someone oppressed, Remember me. But Yusuf, you were only thirsty and hungry for 12 hours, 15 hours. Hussein alayhi salam is thirsty for three days. Yusuf, you were hungry, you were alone, but for a few hours. Later on then you're taken by that caravan. 
there is nothing like the loneliness of, loneliness of Hussein alayhi salam. But also I saw Lawi. There's no comparison. Hussein sallallahu alayhi is an infallible imam. When I saw Lawi, I also th uh, understood something, saw something. Lawi is someone that stands up for his brother even though he was outnumbered. I remembered someone else in Karbala. Abu al-Fadl Abbas, I'm not comparing the two. Abu al-Fadl Abbas is Azim. But they had the same quality. That Lawi sees ten of his brothers outnumbered, but he says, don't kill my brother. He speaks to protect his brother, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas on the 10th of Muharram. And before the 10th of Muharram, says, my body first, then the body of Hussein ibn Ali, alayhi salam. But I say, ya Lawi, you still had to throw your brother down into the well. He experienced pain. If Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was in that situation, he would never allow Hussein to experience pain. I said that Lawi, because he saved the life of a prophet of God was given a gift that the Anbiya were from his progeny. Su'al, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, you saved the life of Imam Hussein and protected it on many occasions. What was the gift that you were given? Response is that when he saves the life and protects the life on many occasions of his brother and master Hussein, the gift that he was given was that Allah made him Babu al -Hawaj. Allah made your du'as answered through the gate that is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. And Allah made him Babu al-Husayn alayhi salam. For what type of brother is this? Quran speaks about this brother, the brother of Yusuf. I saw a brother much greater. I saw a brother that never would call his brother by his name. Rather he would say, oh my master, oh my imam. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, salamullah alayhi. And often on this night, I mention certain things which for me are important for us to mention about Abu al-Fadl. Imam Hassan alayhi salam, on one occasion, he mentions that my father, Marhum Tehrani mentions this. Why? He says, my father had requested us after one year, he had requested me to buy for him a certain type of meat. Everyone wishes to eat certain types of things. We know that Imam Ali has zuhud and piety. That when he had that desire to eat this type of dish, he delays it. After one year, he decides to buy this meat. He gets it cooked for him. Imam Hassan says, I was so happy that my father asked me for something once in his life. It took him one year. He asked me for it. We cooked it. We presented it in front of him. And as he's about to eat, there's a knock on the door. A person says, is there anything for this faqir and this poor man? Ali ibn Abi Talib, after waiting for one year, says, give this to that person. What did we understand from this? We understand that Ali ibn Abi Talib never asks for anything for himself. Ali ibn Abi Talib takes one year just to ask for one thing. He never asks for anything for himself. But if there was one thing that he asked for himself, it was Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, alayhi salam. If it was one thing that he doesn't wait for one year. If it was one thing that he asked and requests for himself, was a brother for my son Hussein alayhi salam. A few weeks ago, there was one of the ulama, maybe even one week ago, one of the ulama of Iran, Sheikh Mahdi rahmatullah alayhi. He was a student of Sayyid al-Khu'i rahmatullah alayhi. Ajma'een, all of the ulama. This Sheikh Mahdi, when he died, people uh, started printing. He was a big, big scholar. They started speaking about some of his experiences that he wrote about. Sheikh Mahdi says, on one occasion, I was leaving my dars after finishing our lesson with Ayatollah al-Uzma Khu'i. I was leaving the masjid and I bumped into the Sayyid in the streets of Najaf. The Sayyid says, Sheikh Mahdi, I'm going to a fatiha of someone who's just passed away. Do you want to come? So Sheikh Mahdi said, why would I not want to accompany my teacher? So I went with Sayyid al-Khu'i for the fatiha majlis of this person who is deceased. I didn't know who it was, but to accompany my ustaf. We got to the gathering. I didn't know, does Sayyid Khu'i know them well? How does he know them? In any case, we got to the gathering and the person was reciting Quran. As the person was reciting Quran, suddenly I saw Sayyid Khu'i burst out into tears. So I began to think, how close is Sayyid Khu'i to the deceased? 
You don't normally cry like that in a majlis fatiha. Unless you know the person very closely. After the majlis finished, I came to Sayyid. Oh, yeah, I said, Sayyidna, this uh, deceased, how well did you know him? Because you were crying a lot. He said, I didn't know him that well. Some are thinking, where am I going with this story? You'll find out. He says, I didn't know him that well. So why did you cry so much? He said, because the Qari Al-Qur'an, the person reciting Qur'an, as he was reading, he stopped and said, we send condolences to the brother of this mayyit. The mayyit has, di has died, the brother is still alive. This person was giving condolences. When he said that, something entered into my mind, that when another brother died, there was no one to give condolences to his brother Hussein alayhi salam. That when Abbas left this world, when Hussein picks up the right and left hand of his brother Abu al-Fadl, there was no one to come and say, Azzam Allah ujurakum ya Abba Abdillah. And that's why I began to cry and that's why I began to wail. This was the musibah on the heart of Hussein, the musibah of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. And whenever we say the name of Abu al-Fadl, Straight away, your mind will go to one thing. De'bal in his poetry, he says, Tawfi utashan bil furayat wa laytani Tawfi tu qabla heen wa fati For these were the people that even though they had the Furat and the Euphrates next to them, they still died whilst they were thirsty without water touching their tongues. For Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was the warrior that was killed next to the Furat without that water ever entering into his body. We're told that the musibah of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and the hands that would be cut were remembered from the time of Amir al -Mu'mineen. For on one occasion, Amir al -Mu'mineen is said to be on his deathbed. As his soul is slowly, gradually leaving from his body, Amir al Mu'mineen calls his son Imam al Hussein and he tells all of his other children to stand in a line, and each of them would place their hands in the hands of Imam Hassan, giving bay'ah, giving allegiance that this will be our Imam after. Ali al Murtada. When suddenly Imam Ali says, I could hear someone crying in the corner of the room, I would stop and say, Who is this boy person that is crying? The answer would come, That is the cry of Ummul Baneen. I would say, Ya Umm al banin why do you cry? The response would come, Ya Abul Hassan, you placed the hands of all of your children in the hands of Imam al Hassan. But why did you leave out my son Abu al Fadl al Abbas? Ali would reply, Because the hands of Abbas will only go in the hands of Hussein for Abbas was for Hussein Abbas was there to take care of Hussein that then a time would come on ten, the 10th of Muharram Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas said many of the companions had gone and were killed and many of our family members had gone and had been killed but I was not given permission to fight for I was the standard bearer of Hussein until a time comes where Abbas would hear the cries of young children Al-Ataj, Al-Ataj We are thirsty, is there any water? Abbas, of course, anyone's heart 
heart would break, he goes to Hussein. He says, Ya Aba Abdullah, do you give me permission not to fight but to get water for the children? Listen to the response of Hussein. Hussein says, First, get permission from your sister Zainab al Kubra, then I will let you go to get water. Abbas says, I went to the tent of Zainab. I sat on the ground. I said, I wish to get water for the children. Zainab says, Ya Abbas, I remember the time in my life, the first time I entered into Kufa with our father, Amirul Mu'mineen. Amirul Mu'mineen would tell me, Zainab, you will be made captive in this Kufa. You will be made prisoner. Do you know what she said? Do you know what she replied to her father? She says, I said, I have. Have 18 brothers and one of them is Abbas how will I be made captive but now that you are going to the battlefield I know my hands will be covered in chains Abbas would be given permission he would go as if he was the son of Ali bin Abi Talib the lion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as he would go the people would make way for they did not wish to fight him whoever would come in his way some would fight some would steer away until Abu al-Fadl gets to the Farad he places his hands in the water he says Ya nafs min ba'd al-Husayn huni wa ba'dahu la kunti an takuni how would Abu al-Fadl Abbas ever drink when Hussein is thirsty? He fills the container that he has. He goes to return. They were unable to fight him face to face. So one of them says, I was hiding behind the tree. Abu al-Fadl would go after, go pass by. I would take out my sword and cut his right hand from behind. He would say, In Qadatum and Yamini, in the Ohai, Abedan and Dini, cut my right hand. I have a left hand. He would take the container in his left. He would continue going. Another Malun says, I hid from behind another tree. I would cut the left hand of Abu Al The container either is in his mouth or falls on the ground and as he is going and his standard would fall some would say that the children would be looking for them from their tents just to see the standard of Abu al-Fadl and when they would see it fall they would realize that he has been attacked that arrows are now piercing his body Abu al-Fadl as he is returning one of them says I shot an arrow in the eye of Abu al-Fadl for when told one of the khutaba was in the shrine of Abu al-Fadl, he says, I mentioned this riwayah that an arrow pierced his eye. One of the ulama was sitting there. The alim, he cries so much, he falls unconscious. The alim would stand and say, never recite this riwayah again. For I cannot bear to hear this musibah of Abbas. This alim, Sheikh Yahya says, I slept that night in my dream I saw Abu al-Fadl Abu al-Fadl says why did you stop my khatib from mentioning my musibah because yes an arrow would pierce my eye and do you not know when someone has something in their eye they use their high hands to remove it 
But I didn't have my hands So I would bend down Try to remove it with my feet Someone would hit him on his head He would fall on the ground He would say Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah Hussein says I ran from the tents I picked up the right hand I picked up the left I said al Hussein would rush to the body. He would place the head of Abbas in his lap. Abbas would place it on the ground. Hussein would place it on his lap. Abbas would place it on the ground. Hussein would say, Oh my brother, why do you not allow? Look at this brotherhood, look at this loyalty. Why do you not allow for your head to be in my lap? He says, Oh brother, I think if my head in my last moments is in the lap of Abba Abdullah, there will be no lap for my brother in his last moments. Abbas would say, when I came into this world, I would set my eyes upon you. And as I wish to leave, I wish to see you for one last time. But in one eye, I have an arrow. In another, I have blood. I would never ask you, oh my master, but remove the blood from my eyes. I would never ask, but my hands have been cut. على لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون النا لله وأنا إليه راجعون يا عباس